Welcome to today's uh, Science and Human Rights webinar. Uh, the title for today's webinar is The Right to Science and Infectious Diseases, Past, Present, and Future. My name is John Dale, and I'm director of Movement Engaged, social movement research hub of the Center for Social Science Research at George Mason University. Uh, we're pleased to be co-sponsoring today's webinar with uh, the uh, Science and Human Rights Coalition of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, I will be moderating today, uh, and uh, we will have three panelists today that I'd like to introduce. Uh, Gisa Dang is a health and human rights consultant and prior nonprofit program director, uh, previously based in New York, Beijing, and Bangkok. She has over a decade of experience facilitating innovative coalitions and local grassroots human rights advocacy strategies challenging political environments, in challenging political environments. Uh, Mike Frick is co-director of the Treatment Action Group's tuberculosis program. He leads TAG's TB portfolio on advocacy to support universal access to TB prevention, research to track, uh, global funding for TB research and development. Uh, he works to define and apply the human right to enjoy the benefits of scientific progress to advance TB research and access. And we also have with us today Dr. F uh, Fifa A. Rahman. Uh, she is a principal consultant at Matahari Global Solutions. Uh, she has over 12 years of experience working in global health, focused on strategic engagement and the amplification of Global South expertise in global health initiatives including uh, via qualitative research, convening of strategic actors, and evaluation of global health projects. Uh, we will also uh, have uh, today Karthik uh, Ramanujam, who's going to be uh, handling questions and answers after our panelists present for about the first uh, 40 minutes or so. Uh, you can uh, introduce your questions in the Q and A at the bottom of your screen, and uh, Karthik will be collecting those uh, to um, ask those questions towards the end. Uh, so, without further ado, uh, I'm going to hand this over to I think Gisa. Are you going to start? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, John. Um, I want to thank our generous hosts um, at George Mason, especially Karthik Ramanujan. Um, and you, John, for bringing us here today. Also want to thank uh, Ollie Moles, um, our sincere appreciation, as always, to our friends at the AAAS Science and Human Rights Coalition, who have been such trailblazers and great colleagues on many things right to science. I am fittingly recovering from COVID, and I'll keep my remarks brief. I have the pleasure of working as a human rights consultant with Mike and Treatment Action Group on the right to science analysis and advocacy. And I'm also an associate consultant with Matahari Global Solutions, where I work with FIFA on mostly qualitative research, including COVID-19 access, which makes this triangle of presentations today especially joyous for me. What I would like to start with is a brief introduction of the right to science. What is it? Where does it come from? And why do we think it's such an important tool in our advocacy toolbox? Mike's presentation will showcase how the right to science and its concepts have been applied by health activists throughout the past 40 years, even if they didn't do so under an inter intentional right to science framework. He will talk about how the right to science addresses many of our most urgent cross-cutting health issues around the globe. And then FIFA will focus on the international COVID-19 response to date, which will be your opportunity to apply your newly acquired right to science knowledge to our ongoing pandemic situation. And I hope that you will see how the things that FIFA will point out could be ameliorated by a right to science framework approach. I hope that by the end of the session, we will have convinced you that the right to science deserves more attention, deserves your attention, and that you will join us in advocating for applying a right to science framework. So what is the right to science and where does it come from? The right to science is enshrined in the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, 
which is a UN treaty. This ICESDR, as we like to call it because all the names are so terribly long, is one of the documents of the International Bill of Human Rights. The other documents that are included in this foundation of human rights law are the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the UDHR, and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR, with its optional protocols. International human rights law lays down obligations which states are bound to respect. When states become party to an international treaty like the ICCPR and ICESCR, they assume obligations and duties under international law to respect, to protect, and to fulfill human rights. Now, what does that mean? The UN offers this specific definition. The obligation to respect means that states must refrain from interfering or curtailing the enjoyment of human rights. The obligation to protect requires states to protect individual and groups against human rights abuses. The obligation to fulfill means that states must take positive action to facilitate the enjoyment of basic human rights. So back to the right to science now. The full name of, the right to, of this right is the right to benefit from scientific progress and its application. It is enshrined in Article 15 of the ICESCR, which you see in its entirety on this slide. I have highlighted the parts we at Treatment Action Group are most concerned with and the, which are the ones that have the most direct application um, to a lot of access to medicines. And, excuse me, <laughs> um, and our research and development work. Which is not to say that any of the others that I didn't highlight aren't important. And some of those might be important, especially for you as those that have joined us as scientists. Um, in international treaties, every word carries a lot of meaning, which is why we must ask ourselves these central questions then. What is science? The never ending discussion. What constitutes scientific progress and what is meant by its applications? And again, here we're able to rely on analysis from UN bodies, including the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights which administers and oversees implementation of the ICESCR, as well as so-called special procedures, the special rapporteur in the field of cultural rights. Because as you see, if you look at this slide, that the right to science is part of cultural rights. Um, we're also relying on the analysis of scholars and practitioners like ourselves. And I want to give a special shout out to this wonderful copy and we'll plop a link to it in the chat later because it's available um, open access. <laughs> so back to those questions, what is science in this context? What constitutes scientific progress? Um, the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights says that the right to science covers all sciences and list life, physical, behavioral, social, as well as engineering and the health professions. I'm sure if we think about it, we might come up with um, additional interpretation of science. Now, implementation of this right, which is something that we're going to be focusing on, especially in the next uh, two presentations, means the following, that states have to provide access for all without discrimination to the benefits of science and its application necessary to a life to, to live a dignified life which includes access to scientific knowledge opportunities for all to contribute to science and scientific research this is a really important component um, because it breaks down this dichotomy between scientists and the rest of us um, and it's really interesting how the right frames um, participation here. We'll hear more about that later as well. 
Now, in order to do that, everybody needs the information necessary uh, to engage in decision making regarding areas of research and development and the related right to information. So, again, I, you know, I think this is pretty obvious. Um, in order to do science, um, as we like to say, you have to be able to have the means to do so, which includes access um, to all kinds of knowledge. And I know there's an ongoing debate um, about um, open science, and I think that might be something to um, think about further in another forum. Now, states also need to develop or support an environment that promotes the conservation, development, and diffusion of science and technology. This is something that Mike will be speaking about more in a little bit. And with that, the freedom indispensable for scientific research. Now I want to repeat some of these key concepts because they're so essential to a full analysis of the right to science and particularly when we're thinking about um, implementation and advocacy. In 2020, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights wrote their general comment on science and human rights, general comment 25, which is the most recent comprehensive analysis from the UN on their right to science. And they said the following about um, the right to science, that um, the right to science encompasses not only a right to receive, but also a right to participate. Um, and in order to do that, everybody needs the following um, which is guaranteed by the right to science. We're talking about access to knowledge and information. And, you know, if you start um, unraveling that, um, you know, you end up talking about things like education, access to libraries, access to um, the internet and other things, um, access to material results and sci of scientific progress, uh, which in our case um, are often things like medicines, vaccines, diagnostic, things that FIFA will talk about in her presentation, um, as well as the access to means, methods, and materials of scientific discovery. Now, the idea of human rights is that they are indivisible and, in, indivisible and interdependent. That means you cannot fulfill your obligation to one right if you neglect another right. And that makes it important to read human rights together and to look at how they interact. In the context of infectious diseases, of course, what comes to mind first is the right to health, ICESCR Article 14, um, but obviously also the right to life. And I think if we think about each of us about our personal experience over the past three years in this pandemic, you will realize that freedom of association and assembly are also crucial, which are the rights to form groups and to meet virtually or in person. So I want to end here um, with this little reminder of why we think um, it is important to think about the right to science when we talk about infectious diseases and pandemics. It's because we think that if this framework is applied as it should be and as it should have been, we would have more secure commitments by states by governments, um, my apologies. We would have a more respons responsive research agenda, um, and Mike will talk more about that. And we would have more equitable distribution of the things that this research agenda produces, all in order for present and future generations to enjoy the benefits of scientific advancement free from discrimination. Mike, I'll pass it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Giza, and thank you for doing this while recovering from COVID. Um, let me start by saying a big thank you to our hosts at George Mason and AAAS um, for bringing us together today. Um, Giza introduced the Right to Science framework and, and talked about its interrelation with other rights, including the right to health. And what I want to do in my talk today is describe some of the ways that we at Treatment Action Group have started to apply the Right to Science framework and its concepts and principles to advance the advocacy that we do calling and promoting research necessary to end the HIV 
TB and hepatitis uh, pandemics. Um, and I've titled my talk Tuberculosis and the Right to Science. I'm going to focus on tuberculosis, which is the uh, disease that I work the most on. Um, and I've titled it this way because it's my feeling that both TB and the right to science are a pandemic and a human right hiding in plain sight, um, although that is beginning to change in some corners. Um, so TB, to start there, is um, often described as the forgotten pandemic. Tuberculosis is an airborne, infectious, primarily respiratory disease, a description that probably sounds uh, eerily familiar to all of us who've just made it through the past three years. Um, estimates are that over the past 200 years, TB is responsible for over a billion deaths. That's a billion with a B. It's a staggering death toll, one that we have largely forgotten as a society, um, especially in the wake now of COVID-19, and despite the fact that TB continues to kill. So last year, an estimated 1.6 million people lost their lives to tuberculosis, and the World Health Organization expects that this year TB will overtake COVID-19 as the leading cause of death from a single infectious agent. COVID-19 reversed a decade of progress against tuberculosis. TB deaths and disease increased for the first time in years. Fewer people were diagnosed and treated for TB and less money was spent on TB programs and on TB research. And in many ways, the WHO attributes the continuing problem of tuberculosis to the lack of scientific advancement against this disease. Um, so until 2012, the last um, TB drug, the last new drug approved for tuberculosis dated to the early 1970s. So there was a decades long drought in TB drug development. Until recently, most TB diagnosis relied on a 19th century technology, the simple microscope, and the only vaccine against TB, which provides very limited protection to adolescents and adults who carry most TB disease, um, was introduced in 1921. So a whole century has elapsed without any uh, new uh, vaccine development against this major pandemic. Um, and so for all these reasons, TB has been considered forgotten, both in terms of public health and in terms of the scientific community and scientific progress against it. At the same time, the right to science is often described as the forgotten human right. This slide uh, quotes human rights practitioners and scholars who have described the right to science as existing at the vanishing point of economic, social, and cultural rights, as receiving too little light and nourishment, has been so obscure and neglected that most governments and international bodies are oblivious to its existence, has been largely ignored. I think that um, all of this neglect is starting to change, and some of these descriptions are now a few years old. Um, but still, I think we struggle for recognition of the right to science within the global health field and within the international human rights field. Um, and for this reason, putting TB and the right to science together, I think, is a natural connection to make. And actually more natural than one might think, I think that TB and the right to science go way back in some respects. Um, when we started our right to science work, we realized that Eleanor Roosevelt, who was one of the visionary architects of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, was actually somebody who died of TB and of drug resistant TB, which is not something that we think about very often in connection with her incredible life. But Eleanor, at the end of her life, um, became sick with TB. She struggled to receive an accurate diagnosis. And it was only after her death that her doctors realized that the TB she had was actually drug resistant, meaning that two of the three drugs that she was receiving to treat it were ineffective against her disease. And the challenges that Eleanor faced in receiving a TB diagnosis and receiving effective therapy are still shared by many millions of people who have TB today and highlight, I think, the lack of scientific progress and attention towards solving this public health challenge. But it was actually um, somebody else uh, who put TB and the right to science together in direct conversation with each other, another human rights advocate, and that was Dr. Paul Farmer, um, who lost his life last year. It was actually this reference of Paul's in a piece he wrote in 1999, which is sort of a decade before the first big wave of right to science scholarship really took off, where he cited the right to science as Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in connection to tuberculosis. 
he was speaking of uh, the situation of TB in the Russian prison system, where prisoners with drug resistant TB were dying because they were receiving, like Eleanor had in a different context, drugs that were ineffective against their disease. And for him, this was an example of our failure as a global community to ensure and live up to uh, the promise that everyone has a right to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. And this was not just the fault of the Russian government, Paul pointed out, but was actually done at the advice of international aid workers who, even though they had documented drug resistance in the Russian prison system, were recommending ineffective drugs based on a logic of cost effectiveness rather than one based on human rights and a recognition that we all have a right to the best available applications of science necessary for the highest attainable standard of human health. So it was this reference, this single reference in Paul's work that actually got us started thinking about tuberculosis in connection with the right to science. But we quickly realized that actually as AIDS activists and those working in global health, we had been working with and applying and appealing to right to science concepts since really the beginning of the AIDS movement. And an early example of this is the Denver Principles formulated in 1983 by a group calling itself the People with AIDS Caucus. It put forward a statement that people living with HIV have a right to be involved at every level of decision making, including in terms of their medical care and their participation in science and research, and be included in all AIDS forums with equal credibility as other participants, as people who have knowledge, expertise, and information to share. And the Denver Principles became the foundation of, in global health, the adoption of the slogan, nothing about us without us, which we borrowed from the disability rights and the women's movement and set the foundation for participation um, and the greater involvement of people living with HIV and now other diseases in all aspects of public health policy making and science. Um, so we didn't name a right to science at this point in the AIDS movement, but we were working with these right to science ideas of participation, autonomy, self-determination and engagement. And from Denver in 1983, a movement against AIDS coalesced, it was international, and it would reshape how medical research was conducted and reshape it along right to science lines. So this is one example from ACT UP, which created an, uh, in 1989, a national AIDS treatment research agenda, basically laying out a technical scientific roadmap for how HIV treatment research should be conducted. And many elements of this roadmap were picked up by the US National Institutes of Health and really created the groundwork for the HIV treatment revolution of the mid 1990s. And I think the point to emphasize here is how international this was. It wasn't just New York City, but also activists in Paris, Rio, Cape Town, Bangkok, many other places organizing together to claim rights, to claim science, and to claim access to the benefits of science and the results of research as a human right. Um, and still at this stage, not naming the right to science, but definitely working within a kind of latent right to science transit uh, tradition. We, I think in global health have now moved from kind of this latent to explicit acknowledgement of the right to science and are now more forthrightly naming the right to science as an international legal standard and a specific human right as Giza described and appealing to it in the advocacy that we do. And for HIV and TB advocates, we really have um, seen science as an advocacy demand, a fulcrum around which to organize across borders, a counter sometimes to hysteria, denialism or fatalism, and a locus of our efforts to achieve equity and access to the highest attainable standard um, of care. And some of the ways that we have been doing this are we're organizing not just to demand research itself, or and not only to demand investment in that research, but also to ask for things that are at the heart of the right to science, including participation in research, not only as clinical trial participants, but actually as people who can shape, influence, the conduct of research, scientific agenda setting, and how research is conducted and shared. So one of the ways we do this is through structures that we call community advisory boards, which bring together people living with or affected by a particular disease to provide input into scientific studies, review those studies, and oversee their conduct in the field. And we've established standards for participation in, in global health research called good participatory practice. In TB, this has involved advocating for clinical trials that include rather than exclude populations at greatest risk of the disease. So for us, that's people living with HIV, 
pregnant people, children, people who use drugs, because we've recognized that if these people who are typically left out of studies are not included in studies, then the results are not applicable to them. Guidelines are written without their inclusion. Drugs come to market with no data on whether they're safe or effective in pregnant people or children. And the result is that the groups that need innovation the most can't benefit from it. In HIV, they fought a similar fight to ensure that research includes more than white cis gay men who still make up the majority of HIV treatment and cure studies. We've also organized to secure access to the benefits of research, which as Giza pointed out, includes tangible things like medicines, diagnostics, vaccines, where we've fought uh, and linked up with the access to medicines movement to challenge um, bad patents, to lower the prices of key drugs and to secure global frameworks for access to medicines. But it's also intangible knowledge and information. And as activists, we're very concerned with the ability of scientists working on these diseases to have access to the means, methods and materials of scientific discovery wherever they live in the world. We've insisted on transparency in the conduct and, and governance of research establishing new laws and regulations for reporting clinical trial results in the United States and the European Union, and are working on now establishing similar rules around the public financing of research, which became a big issue in COVID-19 and something uh, FIFA will talk about, and insisting on civil society equal voice in the governance of research bodies and institutions. And a big part of this, too, is the right to science uh, text that talks about international cooperation and the duty of solidarity. For us in TB, that means the obligation of TB low incidence countries, countries without a lot of TB, which is mostly countries in the global north, to invest in TB research, but to do so in ways that center the expertise and the priorities of TB hybrid in countries, which tend to be developing or middle income nations in the global south. So to ensure that the research itself is done in an equitable way. Basically, the rights of science has given us a way to advance many demands at once, and the development, diffusion, conservation, this kind of tripartite obligation that Giza introduced, has allowed us to say to our governments directly, we need you to invest in research, and we need you to do it in ways that channel resources in what we call a purposive development, that is, trying to solve the problems of groups most marginalized or disadvantaged or most affected by a disease, we need you to share results and diffuse the results of that research and conserve them for future generations. And we feel like we're maybe starting to be heard. So I started talking about neglect and how TB and the right to science are hiding in plain sight. But um, there have been a couple of clues recently that maybe uh, we're getting somewhere. So later this year in September, the UN will hold a General Assembly high-level meeting on tuberculosis. And I was really struck that the official theme of the meeting announced just two weeks ago, basically to my right to science brain, lifted a lot of language in terms of how the right is established in the International Covenant to frame the meeting as advancing science and its benefits, in particular by ensuring equitable access. So a lot of kind of shared terminology there. And similarly, at the WHO, negotiations are underway for a pandemic treaty to help us respond and to and prevent future pandemics. And the zero draft or first draft of the pandemic treaty did include one mention of the right to science in connection with the right to health. So these are small steps. Um, and I think that it's going to take a lot of advocacy to go from kind of rhetorical acknowledgement to real material advancement and benefit. Um, but uh, th these are things that I think may not have happened a couple of years ago. And it's really because as a community, we're starting to work more explicitly on the right to science and apply it to the health issues that we're working on. So I'll end there and just um, say thank you and um, point out a couple of resources um, for those interested in doing more reading on the right to science and in and, and connection to health um, that I hope you'll check out. And FIFA, um, over to you. I'll stop sharing and pass the baton. Thanks so much, Mike. Um, I'll just go ahead and share my screen. So um, today I'm going to talk about the COVID-19 response and what not to do for the next pandemic. As a little bit of context, in addition to my role as principal consultant at Matari Global Solutions, I am special advisor at Health Poverty Action in my civil society role and was the civil society representative to the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator, which is of course hosted the COVAX, but has other pillars as well, which a lot of people don't know about. 
which is why it's sort of really important for me to share the next slide, which shows a sort of structure of the whole ACT Accelerator and sort of how it functioned. So there were four pillars of the ACT Accelerator, including uh, the vaccines pillar, which housed the COVAX. There was a therapeutics pillar, the diagnostics pillar, and the health systems connector. Uh, my role was predominantly on diagnostics and on the facilitation council, as well as the principals group, as you can see on the right. Um, and the facilitation council is where the member states sat, and that happened every couple of months. Um, and member states could really interrogate what, what um, we were doing, but also could tell us about what challenges they were facing. Um, the principals group was a, a, a group that convened every Thursday and uh, was consisting of all the sort of global health leaders and senior leadership of all the global health agencies. So persons like Dr. Tedros, uh, people like Peter Sands um, would be in those calls. And um, I, as a civil society rep, and Peter Owiti, as the communities living with the diseases rep, uh, was there and would report back to civil society uh, a civil society platform. So um, uh, together, this entire um, ACT Accelerator sought to deliver tools to um, the world, really, um, predominantly LMICs. Um, and we know that there were some successes and some major failures, um, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, it should be mentioned probably that some of the successes of the ACT Accelerator was that 80% of tests in the first year of the pandemic were provided by the ACT Accelerator. And of course, it got a lot of oxygen tools to communities all over the world. Uh, but then we do know that there was a lot of inequity in terms of vaccines, which I'll go into shortly. So let's go through a little timeline of selected events. And then, you know, based on Mike and Giza's um, presentations, you can see probably where the right to scientific progress has been ignored. So what should not have been done? Let's start with what happened in mid to late 2020 when the ACT Accelerator uh, established a health systems connector that was solely focused on PPE. PPE and oxygen. Now, oxygen is more of a therapeutic, so it being placed in the health systems connector was a little bit confusing. PPE, of course, important health systems um, um, component, but one of the things that we insisted in the start was that the health systems connector focused on electrification of primary healthcare centers um, that would eventually turn into vaccination centers, and also the use of community health workers and the, the remuneration of community health workers. So um, a, a large majority of community health workers in the Global South are not salaried. They do their work for free, and they do important clinical and promotive work. They, through the pandemic, could have um, delivered um, vaccine information. They could have uh, provided COVID self-tests to communities in villages and, and towns um, across the Global South. But unfortunately, that really wasn't the plan um, in the health systems connector, and that was the first mistake. Moving on to March 2021, jumping a little bit, what was released um, was uh, the UN Women Gender Checklist for Equitable Vaccine Deployment, and, and this was published, and there, there are good reasons why we need a gender checklist. The, the fact is with gender is that women are um, 165 million um, women have less access to cell phones in, in Global South compared to men. Um, there are also many countries that have quite conservative um, and patriarchal attitudes towards permission to women to leave the house, to get, uh, to go to a vaccination center or to go and make any decisions on their health. Um, there's also a lot of countries that still have punitive laws against gender non-conforming and um, LGBT people generally and 
Um, that means a person who is gender non-conforming going to get a vaccine could get harassed and or arrested at vaccination centers. So a, a gender checklist for equitable vaccine deployment should have really been um, deployed or, or made a requirement at the start of every single, uh, not just vaccine deployment, but also diagnostics and therapeutics uh, programmatic uh, programs and planning. Um, but unfortunately, what we saw during the pandemic, and this is coming in an upcoming Matahari and, and Oxfam US report um, on gender and COVID, what we saw was that people were reactively um, um, accounting for gender. Uh, only when they saw that women were not showing up for uh, vaccines or were not taking up tests because they had child rearing responsibilities or because they needed to ask permission for from a man to, to go and um, get the vaccine or um, for example, in Afghanistan, where it's it's uh, under Taliban control and and women can't access health services except from other female health workers. So um, the fact is that not requiring a gender checklist where during grant disbursement and during financial and technical support um, ultimately resulted in, in a lot of women and disproportionately not being able to access technologies and, and scientific products. Moving on now to April, May 2021, when DRC and South Sudan returned vaccine doses to the COVAX. So strategically, why did this happen? Um, it's because a commodities-based approach was the sole approach taken. Um, you can't just um, decide to, to, to dump commodities in a country without the necessary technical and operational support to, to um, deploy the vaccine doses. There also needs to be intense um, and robust communications plans that are context specific and that are led by experts and civil society in country um, and that address the challenges that, you know, the ACT Accelerator, uh, which was populated mainly by Global North experts, just didn't know. Me sitting in the Global North I don't know what the what the context is in DRC. I don't know what the context is in South Sudan. So the fact is that there was a lack of inclusivity in the ACT Accelerator structure. It wasn't just a tick in the box thing. Whenever I mention diversity, there's always somebody cringing in the audience because they think it's this liberal agenda, right? Um, but the fact is, if you don't have diversity, you're... Um, health deployments, your, your health tools deployments are going to be less effective because you just don't have the intelligence. Um, and that was a massive problem. Moving on to um, 2021, um, and this was throughout the year, which is why I haven't specified a month. Throughout that year, Myself, Global Fund, Find, Gates, a number of agencies were pushing for self-tests for the Global South. Now, at this stage, we living in the Global North, I live in the UK, um, you know, everybody in the US um, and Germany, a lot of people had access to self-tests. It was, it was free, widely available in England, at least you could order them for free and they would be delivered to your house. Um, so we were insisting that people in the Global South deserve the same access that we did. In numerous calls through the year, there was a lot of resistance from kind of middle level staff at WHO. Um, and these were very conservative sort of um, um, lab trained people sometimes and other folks that were very focused on the accuracy of tests and uh, meaning that they wanted people to only access PCR or they wanted people to only have self-tests if they knew how to link to treatment and only if they could link the self-test to public health action. Now, of course, when they're talking about people, because all of us in the Global North or most of us in the Global North had access to self-tests, when you talk about people, they were talking about people from the Global South. This was an incredibly paternalistic approach and assumed that people in the global south maybe are 
a little bit stupid. They wouldn't know what to do if, if they had a self-test result or they wouldn't know what to do or, or they wouldn't know how to read the package that would say what to do um, when they get a positive result. So what happened was myself, Carolyn Gomes and Professor Book, Brooke Baker wrote an article calling this out. And this was towards the end of the year when we were quite fed up and we said, look, this is paternalistic and racist. It was then that we progressed to a meeting with Dr. Tedros um, to expedite um, the, the, um, the self-test guidelines. And, and the self-test guidelines were incredibly important because without the self-test guidelines, a lot of countries in the Global South won't progress without WHO recommendations. And large procurers such as UNICEF and Global Fund, they wouldn't be able to purchase the tests because the countries wouldn't accept them without WHO guidance. So, you know, this was a major stumbling block. And if we had the decision early 2021, we would be able to have self-tests in the countries now. Instead, now we are still struggling to get self-test approved because the momentum has gone. February 2022, and moving back to vaccines, we have the COVID Vaccine Delivery Partnership established. Now, this is a really great initiative where um, there was a realization that there was a problem with uptake and that people really didn't understand the context um, in countries as to why people were, were take, not taking up vaccines. Uh, and, and, you know, this was sort of occurring um, around the time when uh, Burla said that African countries are hesitant on vaccines. And, you know, this is quite an ignorant statement. Um, this is, you know, not what re was reflected in the reality. The fact is people had concerns about the vaccines and they weren't addressed, right? That was one factor. There was also the factor like in Haiti, they were having floods, they were having gang violence, kidnappings, um, earthquake, fuel shortages at the same time as people wanting them to take up vaccines. And naturally when you're scared that your kids are going to be kidnapped, uh, you're not really thinking about getting vaccinated. In DRC, it was a situation of people so, sort of respecting uh, church leaders more um, and that church leaders and local local um, provincial leadership had not been engaged. Um, in South Sudan, the vaccines had been placed predominantly in large hospitals, meaning that a lot of people didn't have money to travel to large hospitals um, uh, to to get to the to the to the vaccines. So there are all these contextual factors, but there were certain global health uh, global north actors who said. Africans are hesitant, looping everyone into the same group. So the va COVID vaccine delivery partnership created partnerships between the Global North institutions, working with UNICEF uh, officers in country, working with NGOs to kind of identify what the context specific reasons were for the lack of vaccine uptake and to, and to sort those, right? And to, to create communications plans and community engagement plans um, and, and, and ways to get vaccines to people uh, that made a little bit more sense and with local intelligence. Fast forward to March 2022. Well, it's not really fast. It was slow. The self-test guidelines were supposed to be out um, much earlier than this. But finally, in March 2022, the WHO self-test guidelines were published. And this enabled uh, the likes of Global Fund, UNICEF, and others to procure tests, health tests for the Global South. I was just muted, I don't know why, but okay. In August, 2022, um, Matahari published a report. Um, and this is publicly available on our website which we found health workers in, in rural Haiti, Madagascar and Nigeria did not know what Paxlovid was. And of course, at this time it was available for use in, in, in many global North countries uh, to, to reduce um, the chances of, of people um, developing serious illness and um, hospitalization and death. Um, so it's, 
you know, that there was serious gaps here as well, that there really wasn't a cohesive um, um, communications plan. Um, there really wasn't um, enough done to let health workers know what this was, uh, what what the, what Paxlovid was and, and, and how it could be used. So this is another um, deficiency in, in the COVID pandemic. And of course, I've, what I've done is I've selected- Excuse um, me. Um, yeah. Well, if we're going to have enough time for for questions and answers. We're probably going to have to uh, bring things to a close, if if you could. Yeah, this is the last one. Um, so so there were so many things um, that happened in this pandemic, uh, and these are a selected few. If you'd like to know more, um, we do have everything on our website. So do have a visit, um, and uh, happy to answer any questions. Excellent. Thank you all so much. This were excellent presentations. Uh, we we do have a lot of questions for you, and and I think that's a good sign that uh, <laughs> you're very very clear. I, I wanted to uh, start with with one as people are are gathering more questions. Uh, in April 2020, as you know, uh, the UN uh, Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Uh, elaborated its general comment number 25. Uh, the Science and Human Rights Coalition of the AAAS also contributed input to that general comment. Uh, and in paragraph 71 to 75, uh, there's acknowledgement of the ways in which digital technologies are becoming increasingly hitched to science. Uh, and also, I think as, as Mike and, uh, and people were both mentioning the zero draft of the guiding principles on business and human rights uh, start to become addressed in those paragraphs as well, especially the responsibilities of big tech corporations uh, in uh, their obligations to our, our right to science. Um, I'm wondering, uh, as you think about the importance of the dissemination of scientific information, uh, and we've seen a lot of this during during COVID, uh, now under attack through forms of intentional disinformation on big tech platforms, sometimes taking the form of, um, you know, anti-vaxxer uh, misinformation. I think even our own president uh, was <laughs> participating in some of that at one point. Uh, we all recall recommendations of taking bleach as a potential uh, way of addressing uh, COVID. What, how does this issue uh, start to come into play in some of the work that you're seeing around a human right to science? Do, does TAG ever have to uh, confront these sorts of, of battles over a right to the dissemination of scientific information? Yeah, it's a, such a great question. And I think um, the context today is obviously so different than it was even just a few years ago with kind of advancement of communication technologies. But it's not as though those of us working in, in AIDS or TB have not been here before. I mean, AIDS denialism was a major force um, early in the epidemic, um, one that my colleagues at TAG have spent a lot of time personally confronting. And I think there are kind of lessons from that experience, um, sometimes even sort of state sanctioned AIDS denialism under, you know, certain South African president, <laughs> who I won't name today, um, you know, creating a kind of delay in response that has been attributed to the loss of, you know, a lot of life. And so I think we, the situation of misinformation and disinformation isn't new, but it's been put into a kind of hypercharged you know, system that I think the law and regulation to be blunt hasn't fully like kept up with. And I think the right to science can give us a way to think about it. I'm not sure that as a legal framework in international law, it's sufficient on its own to really tackle it. Um, but it's something that I think all of us working in any health field are gonna have to think a lot more about. Thank you. Uh, Ali, did you did you have a question that you wanted to, to raise or? Oh, you're okay. Are you on mute? 
I think there are a couple in the chat box uh, which would be useful. And I'm sorry, uh, uh, I'm not sure people could get into uh, the question and answer section. Uh, but uh, please uh, pick those up if, if you can. I think they were very good. And I'm going to turn things over to Carthy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I can read the questions uh, in the order in which they um, came in and uh, the and who one of who are the was the concerned panelists you can respond to it i guess uh so the first question is uh from uh, richard cronkite uh sorry if i mispronounce your name uh how are prices determined for access to a, for all so i think his concern is, is he he raised this question when gisa was presenting so probably it's directed at gisa well, I would probably push this one to FIFA because she is the uh, expert on um, IP law. Yeah, power prices determined. Um, <laughs> the so that they are determined quite arbitrarily, to be honest. And and what a lot of pharmaceutical companies have is a tiered pricing policy. Um, and when we were working on Hep C, and um, and Mike will probably have more TB examples. When we were working on he on Hep C, Gilead was marketing uh, the Hep C drug off as Bavir, um, and uh, to to a bunch of countries, and designated a certain price for Malaysia, and said it was based on GNI per capita. But when we plotted the graph. Uh, of GNI per capita versus prices and Malaysia was in between Hong Kong and Brazil, there was kind of no rhyme or reason and no kind of um, logical reason why Malaysia would, would get a much higher price than Brazil. Um, so so they, they, they kind of use GNI per capita lots of times to say, look, we're offering you tiered pricing, but it, it really is quite arbitrarily, arbitrarily determined, especially because a lot of Sofos Bouvier uh, a lot of investment that went into software Superveer were public was public uh, taxpayers' money, um, and we did a calculation on that just to close off um, that um, the money that Gilead made in the first and second year, and I think the second year of their marketing software Superveer, they made nineteen point two um, billion. Um, it, it, the amount that they would have taken to recoup um, um, that money was something like four days, so quite arbitrarily determined. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rahman. Um, I, I probably ask another question related to uh, clinical trials. So how you looked into the ways in which subject selection for clinical trials tend to exclude the neediest and sickest people? Where can we go with this? From uh, Doug uh, Samuelson. This is a big problem and definitely something that happens in TB where we see that trials define enrollment criteria, you know, who's eligible to participate by kind of pre-selecting often for like easier forms of disease. So often, you know, we'll see that a trial will say, if you have TB and you have a lot of cavitation in your lungs, you can't participate. Um, or if you're someone with a comorbidity like HIV, you can't participate or a risk factor or some quality that makes you a greater risk of TB like pregnancy or the potential to become pregnant, you can't participate. So this is where we've actually really applied the right to science framework, I think, in a way that has achieved real change, because through community advisory boards, these community structures that are meant to kind of advise research that is happening, we have reviewed clinical trial protocols before they've started to question and push back on these exclusion criteria and to bring evidence forward to say, you need to include these groups, you need to find a way to do it. And we have had trials that have changed and rewritten their exclusion criteria to be more inclusive and diverse. And we've tracked how that has allowed those trials to generate evidence that allows WHO and other governments to write guidelines that are broader and more inclusive and link more people to care. So I think this is a way, I mean, it's sort of in the details and in the weeds, but it's applying right to science to say the research we're doing has to be community informed, has to be inclusive and has to meet need in order to have equitable access and the diffusion of scientific benefit. It's a great question. I think we are close to the end. If there's a very brief uh, question and, and comment, we can take it. Uh, Karthik, I'm not sure. Otherwise, we'll wrap up. There's just a general question about a social program communication. So what was that a sort of hindrance uh, in get, getting the message about the vaccine out? So 
So is this the confusion in the... Um, so I think the messages about the vaccines, it really was context specific. There's no one reason um, that affected it. There was some country, country uh, uh, patients in countries going, still remembering sort of the syphilis trials that were that were done on, on black people. And there was a suspicion of Western uh, brought interventions and, and interventions promoted by people from the West. So you know, there's there's a lot of different reasons why why those existed. Um, to to make a short answer. Thank you, thank you all very much. I want to give a hearty thanks to all the presenters, and uh, to the project team at the George Mason University in particular for stepping in when I had te technical difficulties here at the beginning. I just want to say that this is part of a series of coalition webinars since 2017, first on aspects of program evaluation and innovations in evaluation, and in recent years on contributions of scientists to human rights organizations and human rights issues. All these webinars are archived by the AAAS, and that should appear on the chat if you're interested in previous ones along with the listing of them. Thank you all for joining us. Another webinar is scheduled for April 20th on how democracies can deal with the rise of digital repression. Please tell your friends and colleagues about the webinars and tell us about them, about these people and others who might, we might uh, want to invite, who might be interested in being invited. Uh, please stand by also to take a very short survey to help us plan and improve future webinars and comments can be sent directly to the team leader, to me, Ali Moles, at ocmoles at gmail.com. Thank you. Any final comments from others? Appreciate very much your help and your assistance and all the good information you have shared with us today. Thank you, and good luck in your work, all of you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Good to have you. Glad to see you all. Take care.